afternoon, Gazorpus Orps and Gazorpus Orp Fields. I'm Alma Carranza, and this is Trojan Arcade. What's Trojan Arcade? It's a bit too late to ask that, my dudes, but if you sit there, I'll show you. On this week's show, we have a review of Ubisoft's latest For Honor. In honor of For Honor, we set up a lesson with the USC fencing team, and you, lucky viewer, get to see the aftermath. Later on the show, we're putting up part two of our PSX coverage, and maybe we'll blab our little mouths a bit. Who knows, you know, it's only February. The possibilities are endless. Now, as per usual, bringing you all sorts of gaming news are two of the only three men I trust. Who's the third? Obama. Until we get him on the show, you'll just have to settle. Take it away, newsboys. I'm James Alessi. I'm Cam Greeley. And this is your week in video game news. In an interview with the official Xbox magazine, Mac Walters, the creative director of Mass Effect Andromeda, has made three somewhat surprising announcements. The first of which is the removal of the Paragon and Renegade system. Instead, Bioware will be adding totally different agree or disagree dialogue systems, which is probably nothing like the previous binary system. The second announcement comes from the producer, Michael Gamble, who announced, I definitely wouldn't call Andromeda an open world game. We like to think of it as a term exploration based game. What does that mean? Probably nothing. Especially because Mass Effect 2 and 3 weren't really open world games either. The final announcement is from producer Fabrice Camunis, stating that the team is working hard to make the side quests in Andromeda to be akin to The Witcher, which is great, because while Mass Effect 2 and 3 had some great side missions related to the teammates, the majority consisted of mind-numbing treasure hunts that left you endlessly scanning useless solar systems. Yesterday, Niantic and the Pokemon Company announced that all of the Pokemon from the Johto region will be available in the next update for Pokemon Go. You may recognize some of the classic Gen 2 Mons, such as the beloved starters Shikorita, Cyndaquil, and Totodile. Previously, some Generation 2 Pokemon were available for capture, but those were simply pre-evolutions of Generation 1 Pokemon. Now the entire Johto Pokedex will be included. Also, the new update comes with new berries, which will help slow down the movements of wild Pokemon and double the amount of candy earned from catching a Pokemon. All of the updates will be available this week. If you thought you caught them all, think again. Sorry, nerds. Guess you're forced to go outside again. Hey, notice this shirt I'm wearing? Pretty cool, right? How did I get this fine garment, you might wonder? Well, National Geographic sent it to us to promote their new show, Origins, about the origin of humankind, which starts airing on Nat Geo Monday, March 6th at 6 p.m. Pacific. What does this have to do with video games, you ask? Absolutely nothing. If you haven't lived under a rock your entire life, you've probably heard of the gaming YouTuber PewDiePie, the most subscribed user on the platform. As of recently, he's switched away from gaming content, and his videos can be rather controversial for comedic effect. There was recently an incident where PewDiePie was making fun of a website, Fiverr, where you can pay anyone to say anything for just $5. Specifically, he paid people to say death to all Jews, and he paid someone dressed as Jesus to say Hitler did nothing wrong. Note that these were both jokes to test how far people would go for $5, and as a matter of fact, the death to all Jews thing was supposed to be followed by a joke to subscribe to another YouTuber known as Keemstar, because he had exhibited, uh, exhibited previous racist behavior, but the news seems to mysteriously omit this part. Both Disney and YouTube felt that this was going way over the line, and Disney proceeded to terminate his partnership, and YouTube canceled the second season of his show, Scared PewDiePie. Bye, you. A SNES game archivist reported this week that $10,000 worth of SNES games went missing in the mail. Bayou was planning on receiving a shipment of 100 games from a European collector sometime last month, but the package seems to have disappeared somewhere in Jersey City. Yes, New Jersey City. He suspects that USPS has either stolen or lost the package, most likely stolen. Sadly, as a result, Bayou has decided to halt his SNES preservation project. Nintendo has announced an expansion pass for Breath of the Wild, the first DLC for a main series Legend of Zelda game ever. The pass will cost $20 on launch and will be available for the Wii U and Nintendo Switch versions of the game. The pass unlocks two packs. The first available summer 2017 unlocks a hard mode and a new Cave of Trials challenge and an unspecified feature on the in-game map. The second pack, available in the holiday season of 2017, unlocks a new dungeon, a new original story, and additional challenges. The packs also uh, feature three treasure chests, two containing useful items, and one weirdly containing a shirt with the Nintendo Switch logo. Many are outraged at Nintendo for resorting to uh, paid DLC for the classic franchise that had always been released as a full game on launch. Others retort, just don't buy the DLC. 
On August 15th, Sony will drop PlayStation Now support for PlayStation 3s, Vitas, PlayStation TV, older Sony Bravia TVs, Sony Blu-ray players, and Samsung TVs. Basically, if you don't have a PS4 or a PC, there's no more PlayStation Now for you. The Pokemon Company has announced a new smartphone game set to launch in Japan sometime this spring titled Hanarara Kaikenga! Or Splash Magikarp. That's it. It's a game about Magikarp. The Pokemon that is virtually useless in battle. Cool. And that's all for this week in video game news. Back to you, Alma. Ubisoft released For Honor this week, a hack and slash action adventure game that takes place on a fantastical battlefield with Vikings, Samurai, and Knights. Oh my! It came out on Valentine's Day. How perfect. I spent the day ripping out hearts. I know you all value and worship my opinion, so here's what I had to say about it. Ah, E3, what a strange, deceitful beast. Amidst the loud music and neon lights, you get me excited for games that no one in their right mind should be excited about. Just look back at our coverage of this year's event. No, like, seriously? You can pause this and go back on our coverage of E3 2016 on our YouTube page. I'll wait here. Ooh, kittens. You good? Cool. Now, what games were we excited for? What got our best of show? Mostly Mafia 3. Now, why on earth were we excited for Mafia 3 when we knew that the first two were not that fun? It's simple. 2K dazzled us with a cool booth, a live band, and free t-shirts. Boom. Done. We were sold. But, dazzled by the glam of 2K, we failed to even notice the signs about For Honor over at Ubisoft. Sure. I played it, but overstimulated as I was, I wrote the game off as generic sword fighting and moved on, never noticing just how special the game could actually be. For Honor takes place in a mythical war between Vikings, Knights, and Samurai, and allows players to finally settle the argument as to which soldiers of old truly are the most badass. The game allows players to step into the shoes of different fighters from each faction and battle head-to-head -head for supreme dominance. While this sounds like an amazing setup for the next Percy Jackson movie, the game never really capitalizes on the premise and utilizes this idea primarily as a backdrop for vaguely divined online multiplayer. That being said, I did find myself getting sucked into the story of each faction's struggle. Similar to Battlefield 1's setup, each faction has its own self-enclosed campaign that presents the eternal struggle between Vikings, Knights, and Samurai from each of the clan's perspectives. Each clan is fun to play, and though I often struggled with comprehending the objectives, I found myself constantly pushing towards the next mission. These missions act as tutorials for different character types of the game, with each story serving as an extended walkthrough of all the game's mechanics. I'm happy to report that I am not good at playing the Peacekeeper class, and I became very annoyed when I died for the 20th time halfway through the night storyline. <laughs> Now, to be quite honest, the campaign story frustrated me more than anything else. It's just so close to being great, but never gets there. It's like it's apologizing the entire time that it's not the multiplayer. The writers establish a lore for their world and motivations for their central characters, but nothing about this lore feels unique or cool. There are cool ideas scattered throughout each two-hour campaign, but nothing really makes For Honor a groundbreaking medieval fantasy. Everything's been lifted from other, better stories. The game just never pushes far enough. It attempts to be a serious tale of eternal struggle, but I never felt the weight of any of my actions due to the distance the, the game inserts between its characters and their actions. I mean, this game is about a war between Vikings, Knights, and Samurai. When I jump into a game like that, I expect some medieval Kill Bill. It's right there in the premise, but it never does anything to capitalize on it. With this in mind, the conversation leads us back to one question. If the story isn't that great, why was I sad that I disregarded For Honor at E3? The answer is simple. This is some of the best combat I've experienced in a very long time. Now, when I was a kid, I would run around on the playground with a stick, fake fighting with my friends, pretending to be knights. While other games have tried to capture the excitement I felt during those pretend sword fights, none of them have been able to come as close as For Honor. Each battle feels like a genuine challenge, a tactical face-off where one wrong move could lead to defeat, and a smart move can bring you back from the dead. It feels like a battle between two heroes in League of Legends, with each player testing the other, waiting for the chance to strike. You can never underestimate an opponent. 
Even when they're near death, a series of clever attacks and parries can lead to your downfall. This makes each one-on-one -on -one battle unique and engaging. I'm forced to wait, observe, and strategize, while my usual playstyle is typically the opposite. Delivering this nuanced form of combat to players is like riding a knife's edge. Be too tough and the game will be impossible for newcomers. Be too easy and it will become a button-mashing fever dream. For the most part, the game manages to avoid this by rewarding a player for thoughtful moves and punishing you when you get too cocky. This give and take often leads to what feels like dramatic spikes in difficulty, with the boss being a pushover and the lackey being next to impossible. And, if I'm being honest, I blame this more on me than the game. With each boss battle, I was ready to kick some carefully calculated ass, while each lackey encouraged me to come out swinging, a strategy that almost never worked. And now this same problem persists in the multiplayer. Each one-on-one -on -one duel feels amazing and complex, which felt thrilling when I won and exhausting when I lost. Emotional payoffs I didn't get during the more chaotic battles. Instead of pure skill, the domination modes rely on luck and teamwork, two things that are pretty difficult to find on public servers. Yes, I may win a match, but gone is my Game of Thrones-like planning. Instead, I dissolve into, how fast can I mash R2? Now, with all my nitpicking aside, I really do love For Honor. The combat feels empowering, and each kill gives me a rush I haven't felt since Modern Warfare 2. Hopefully, Ubisoft fine-tunes its features and sends a bigger, better, and bloodier sequel our way. We give For Honor 8 death grunts out of 10. So long as I am on this show, we are never ever going to use stars to rate games, because that's boring. So. Obviously with For Honor, the big part is there's no guns. It's all swords and all sorts of hacky slashy things. So when it comes to sword fighting in video games, I mean, it gave me a throwback to Assassin's Creed 2. Yeah. Did you guys play that? Yes, a yeah. long time yeah. ago. Yeah, it was a while back, back in Ezio's day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they were just like, you know what, this Italian guy gets, gets buys. We're just going to use him for three more games. Did you just say on. Ezio? Ezio. Ezio. I'm an Italian person. You're on Italian. The show. I know. I, Ezio. I think if there's anything we know about me is that I don't ever pronounce anything right, and it's sad. And I yeah. even when I ask, I usually pronounce it wrong anyway. Anyways. Anyway, he was is. great. <laughs> he was great. But other other sort of fighting games in my repertoire, I was a big Star Wars guy, as we also know. I'm astonished. I know. It's no it's one a big knew. Surprise. But uh, the big one was the Force Unleashed, which kind of went from the turn-based lightsaber games that had kind of been the predecessors to this new. I don't know, like a little bit more flexible sword fighting where like all of the different buttons did different moves and, and also you could like do this similar thing to For Honor where you lock blades and you had to like mm -hmm. button mash or like do different combinations in order to like get out of it and there's a lot of like creativity with the, the mm -hmm. look of it. Which I think was kind of reflected by For Honor, but I mean yeah. Force Unleashed came out ten years ago, so yeah. right. so it was obviously yeah. it was a worthwhile mechanic that someone in there had to be like either someone in there was like, Oh, I remember playing this game and it had this mechanic or they were just, you know, brainstorming and came up with like, oh, let's use this in sword fighting, because that's how sword fighting really works. Yeah. I mean, not that I would know much because the last sword fighting experience I had in real life was stage combat, which is just gracefully choreographed. I'm going to tap you now. <laughs> <laughs> but like with Assassin's Creed two, what I can't remember because with Assassin's Creed 2, it's a lot of button mashing. Mm -hmm. Right. But, like, I don't ever remember... I remember blocking, but I don't remember necessarily, like, locking swords or anything. Oh, no one blocks. No. You shouldn't block. I no, mean, no, no. It's always just hack Well, and you slash. block to lead into a combo. Sure. Eh, yeah. I don't block. Right. Attack no blocking. We die like men. Good attack's the best defense. You and don't that's put how I play every on video the triggers. Game. That's true. That is also how I play every video game. Yeah. Which you really have to change when you play For Honor. You have to, like, because normally, I mean, I'm a diva main in Overwatch. I feel like that just explains my entire play style in terms of, like, I just kind of charge forward, like, shooting constantly. I don't really play a defense. Um, but with For Honor, I actually had to, like, play a defense, which was so weird. Yeah. In pretty much every game, I'm, like, the soldier or, like, the knight archetype that's, yeah. like, all health and attack and literally, like, nothing that helps you on defense or, like, magic yeah. or anything in terms of, like, Skyrim and stuff. It's more like a tank character, and then you just, like, ah, let the other people do the healing for pretty me. Much. Yeah, which, again, sort of embodies my, my own, like, perspective on how warfare would be. Like, I would die really fast. Oh, I right. would die like, so like, fast. Would, like, if we were having a real, like, warfare, like, swords or guns type of style, like, I would die really fast because I don't have, like, real health. There's no girth to my body, I would just get shot and die, <laughs> and then it would be over. Yeah. yeah this is and he's gone. And, and he's gone. gone. And yeah. the man is dead. Yeah. And he's and I gone. Think, personally, yeah. I think that the future of sword fighting is kind of displayed by some of the VR games that are going on right now that are right. really cool. Like Raw Data, if you haven't checked that out, check it out. You can block bullets with a laser sword. It's kind of like being a Jedi. <laughs> 
and uh, you actually get to wield the sword itself. So, yeah. and then of course there like is actually like the lightsaber demo. Yeah, where you which can is, be a Jedi. Yeah, I heard that VR. just came out. I haven't tried that yet, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. Well, point is, no one give us real swords because it'll just be chaos. And that's it for our first half. Go ahead and plug in your carburetors and recharge your antifreeze, and we will be right back. Hi there. Vinny here. You may know me from my other products like the Key Row. I've got an amazing new product for you that you can't afford to miss. Are you tired of all these remotes? Look at them. They're crazy. What are you, Patrick Seward? Come on. They got like 10 with like six different buttons. You can't do all that math. That's a load of garbage. You can't deal with this. You're the junior VP of sales at Janice Montgomery Scott, who just wants to dance. You know the kid in, Bro in Bronx Tales? Actually, he's not even Italian. He's Colombian. Ditch these born remotes and make out like a Rocky Mountain goat at Christmas. This is the new Trojan Vision Sensation Infrared Transmitting Remote Control Device. Sis. So you come home from work, long day at work. You just want to watch some Trojan Vision. You just press one button. Boom, TV's on. No complicated math. Want to pause A? Maybe press the pause A button. My cousin did the pause A button. You want to turn it off? It's over. Press the off button. Just one button. And for all you health nuts out there, that's right. Get this. Trojan Vision remote, 100% gluten-free. That's right. We tried to make one with gluten. Look, doesn't even work. Now call now and get this amazing remote for just $19.99. And call in the next 15 minutes, and we'll include a photo of me at my niece Angelina's wedding, free of charge. Come on, guys, I can't do this all day. Trojan Vision, guaranteed to be good for your money. Yeah, no, seriously, I, I can't do that. Uh, yeah, no, 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 I, 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 I really, really, uh, like, I got this thing going on this side. Like, use library books, okay? I, you just go in, right? You get, like, a, it's like, a, like, they kill a mockingbird, you check it out for, like, a, like, a, like a two weeks. They don't, they don't care. They don't care about that book. You flip that book, give it to a student, like 15 cents. You make 15 cents. I make like 15 cents like every two days. It's amazing. It's just like it, it, it hemorrhaged money. It's incredible. We sent our unpaid interns to learn what's what from the USC fencing team. Are they capable of becoming skilled sword fighters? Absolutely not. Let's see if I'm right. A new game for honor tells the story of the greatest warriors throughout the generations. And now it's our turn to take the helm. I'm Cam. And I'm Armand. We're joined by the Trojan Fencing Club, and we're training to become warriors. Today we have the fencing master, Noah, and he's going to show us how to become masters at the art of fencing. What's our first step? Well, the first thing we got to do, guys, is get you some gear. So let's get suited up. Just jam your arms straight through there. Okay. And the light goes through the hole, right? Exactly. So I see you're wearing more loose pants. Is that uh, a... Yeah. Uh, so. Other, yeah, there we go. That's it. Is uh, skinny jeans recommended? Uh, or that's not what I would recommend. No. No. I think fencing convention, want to bend your knees a little bit. Uh, a true fencing master like me can always zip a jacket up in one try. Mm. How long does it take yeah. to learn something like that? That's years, years of practice. It's zip on, zip off. Oof. We'll yeah. try to be fast learners. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the second step is we need our mask for fencing. Uh, so we've got some, some nice large size yeah, masks. Yeah, that's good. Into that. Oof. Okay, shake your head. Yeah, that's too big. Got it. Give it one of these. Give me one of these. Me too. Okay, looks good. So the next step. Usually we get like Beekeeper, not Darth Vader, but I guess I see where you're coming from. The final piece of the puzzle here is our weapons. So we're going to be fencing with foils today. There are a few different styles of fencing, and it's just based on which weapon you use. So with the foil, hold it like this, put your thumb on top, wrap your fingers around just like this to give you control of the sword. Yeah, it looks good. Perfect. Nice. You guys are naturals. Right. That's a good shot. Now, first thing we want to learn when we're fencing is our stance. So since this is a one-on-one -on -one sport, 
and I'm just fencing you in a rectangular strip. I want to stand sideways to you so there's less target to hit. So I stand with my front foot facing straight forward, my back foot at 90 degrees, and bend my knees. Uh, after, after we've got our on guard position and our movements down, we got to learn how to attack. So our basic fencing attack is a lunge. And my favorite thing about lunging is that it's really fun to do in skinny jeans. So you guys are about to have a blast doing this. That's it. You got it. You got it down to it. Yeah, there you go. I think you guys are looking like experts already, so if you want, it could be time to fence. I challenge you. Round one. Fight! Another point for the fencer on the left. Whoa! Okay. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! I win. Best. There's no beat in the triangle, it's a perfect position! These are the best and the brightest pupils I've ever had under my tutelage. Ready for this? Honestly, no. This is really exhausting. Alright. Oh, there. I think that's a point for the fencer on the left. Oh. Come back. So we do, we do one more. And that'll decide who is the champion. Valhalla, I'm coming! Ah. Uh, that good, yeah! All right. You have fought nobly, my friend. But now it is time that the student became the master. I challenge you, Noah. Yeah, okay. And so as you can see, it takes a lot more than one training session to become a master and to fight for honor. But we'll be back. We will be back. As per usual, I'm right. I don't know what to tell you. Now then, last week we gave you a tantalizing teaser about our time at PSX down in Anaheim. Well, we knew you were dying for more, so here's part two. We're here with Taku. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about the game, give us the elevator pitch, what's new? Yeah, so Gran Turismo Sport is the uh, first Gran Turismo on the PS4. I don't know if you know Gran Turismo, it's the biggest racing game for Sony. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, we haven't released our game for the PS4 yet. So this will be our first one. And we're calling it uh, GT Sport. Um, it's actually the seventh Gran Turismo, but we call it Sport because we're getting into the eSports uh, world with this game, where we have our fans uh, represent their, own, their favorite car companies, their favorite country, and they come and do like a little Olympics World Cup in the game. And whoever wins, get to get uh, invited to parties and maybe a driving license in real life and stuff like that, big prizes. Uh, and then here you have the VR uh, demo where you can play in VR. It's great, VR is a natural fit for racing games when you race and when you can look around and you see all of the scenery, you can see yourself. Uh, it's, it's a great feeling. 
Uh, it's a natural. It really works well with the racing games. Yeah. So you said that there's going to be a big, uh, you know, aspect with esports. How would you say uh, the new Gran Turismo is both a game for, you know, hardcore audiences and more casual audiences too? Yeah. Um, so our our whole slogan with this game is driving is not painful. Driving is fun. I mean, just like in real life, you you get a whatever car you like. It's it's fun driving it. So we want to just bring that all over to over the game. It's not about being. Not, people call it sometimes call it a simulator, but it's not. It's not like a simulator. It's more about enjoy enjoy the enjoy your cars, enjoy the life of driving. That's all. So, what's your uh, what's your particular favorite part of the game? My favorite part is I have to say I do like the photo mode that I just talked about um, because uh, literally you can take like I, I I'm a big BMW fan, but I can take my BMW and take it to like uh, my my country Japan and go to like a really old ancient village in front of a temple or something and you put your place your BMW right in front of it and you know make it you can make the you can change the kind of the lighting of it you can kind of have your own little studio in the game you take the beautiful it, I, I get all nerdy about that mode and you can take like beautiful photos and then you can share it on post it on Facebook or Instagram and share it with your friends saying hey this is my you, and, you, and it almost looks like real life a real life photo so yeah, it's a great way to share uh, your passion on, on cars Tell us a little bit about the game um, for those that don't know. Yeah, Persona 5 is the first numbered sequel to the Persona series since 2008. So Persona 5, you're playing as the Phantom Thieves and you're going around in Tokyo changing the hearts of people. So it's got a big theme of rebelling against authority and you know just kind of not taking authoritative figures seriously. You're not, not blindly listening to what they said. Something I think we could all use a little bit more of in our day to day. Um, so can you tell us a little, little bit about um, your company's approach to the localization process for Persona 5? Absolutely. So with localization, it's a really complex process. We want to try and make sure that the game stays as true as it can to the Japanese version, but at the same time, you know, not necessarily make people have to go out of the way to understand Japanese culture that they may, you know, Japanese jokes or anything that they may not get. Um, Persona 5 especially, you know, unfortunately we had to delay the game. I'm so sorry. Um, but that's because we are going back to the localization and just checking it to make sure that everything, you know, is the best it can possibly be for this game when it comes out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, you. Once again, this is John Harden. Um, Persona 5 comes out in North America on April 4th, 2017. Look and forward Europe. to it. North and America Europe. and Europe. Oh, it and Europe. Matter, unless you've got some transfer students, because I forgot, <laughs> this for the Trojans only. Ah, <laughs> yeah. I'm awesome at interviews. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Good luck to your video editor. Well, we had a great time today at PlayStation Experience 2016. Now, back to studio. And that's it for today. This might have been Trojan Arcade. I might be Alma Carranza. He might be James Alessi. He might be Cam Greeley. And this might be The Matrix. Good night, Los Angeles. You're watching Trojan Vision. For more of your favorite shows, check us out at trojanvision.com and like us on Facebook.